he was born in Thessaloniki, which was a Greek city, but it was ruled by the Turks. Maurice was placed in a public school. He didn't have any friends, but he started giving all the students answers to the math and everything else. So he had an instant group of friends. And he stayed there until he was about 16. And at this time, he was conducting and composing music. He wrote that one day I found that I could read a score. <laughs> and what had really happened was that he had listened to his sister get piano lessons. Without betraying his presence, he didn't dare do it with the knowledge of his father. His father was a pharmacist and had in mind that Maurice would be a doctor. And when Maurice walked away from the pre-med program, his father opened the door and said goodbye and good luck. He left and he went to Germany where everything was happening and his brother Ernest started giving him the pocket change. What he was doing with his pocket change was buying scores. And only when the pain became so great that Maurice couldn't stand the hunger, he'd buy a biscuit, but with these few coins, he was buying scores and studying. Werner Jansen lived in Los Angeles. His wife was Anne Harding, who was a well-known movie star at, the, at that time. <clears throat> And he uh, would, all, would fly up here, up to Salt Lake for a, a couple of rehearsals, conduct a concert, go back to Los Angeles. And it w was very obvious fairly early on that that was not the way to build an orchestra. You need to have somebody who is on the scene they're working with the musicians and, and part of the community to really build an orchestra. There was kind of a, a disagreement amongst the local people as to whether it would be important to keep, hold on to Werder, who was fairly famous, or try to get somebody young in, in his place who would be willing to come to Salt Lake. So they decided that to send a delegation back to New York and interview these people and listen to their conducting and so on. There were two principal people they recommended. One's name was Leonard Bernstein, who was unknown at the time, and the other one is also unknown, at least as far as local people, was Maurice Abravanel. People have asked me, well, if he were that great, why did he come to Salt Lake City? Well, it was a very, very simple answer. And quoting him, it was an ego trip. He thought of it as plowing absolutely new ground. Many times he said, anybody can conduct the New York Philharmonic Orchestra. They play by themselves. But what I wanted to do was to create an orchestra. Could I make an orchestra that could do justice to the great musical repertoire? When Maurice came, he did bring uh, his principals from New York with the idea that when he chose his orchestra or his sections, that they would teach and never talk down to these musicians, ever, ever. And so they had a, he had a level here that the musicians rose to. I particularly enjoyed his honesty and his integrity and his devotion to his musicians. Nothing escaped him as far as their reception and their treatment. Every year he tried to increase the load, the, the, the load for the musicians to become a full-time job, which of course it wasn't when I joined. You, you had to be a music teacher or, or, or something and be working in an office to play in the symphony when I joined because it wasn't enough to keep you going. Everybody felt that his salary should be increased and the group went to talk with him 
And he said no, he didn't want any money. That he wanted to have his musicians increased first. And I at the time thought that was remarkable because he certainly could have made more money at another symphony. But he, from the very beginning, was devoted to building the Utah Symphony. And so that was the beginning of a kind of loyalty that you, that's hard to imagine. Out of all the places he lived, he never felt he had a home until he came here. And his family was the orchestra. He was never afraid to speak up and tell people what he thought. And on the other hand, though, he could be very diplomatic. And he always wanted the Mormons and the non-Mormons to get along. And he did everything he could to build a community. Why he decided to settle in this area, uh, you know, I talked to him about that. And you know what he said? He said that he found that people really appreciated beautiful music. He referred to the Mormon pioneers as his ancestors. I've heard that in dozens of speeches that he gave on many occasions. Naturally, they were all about the Utah Symphony. And they all included the fact that they had brought musical instruments pump organs, violins, and so on, in covered wagons across. And, that, and he was so proud that his ancestors had done that. Not your ancestors, but my ancestors, meaning his own. So there was this incredible ability to identify and to live within a culture that was totally strange to him. He was strange to us. But his love, his dedication to that, to bringing the best of classical music to Utah was the, the theme that dominated all of his years. Here.